Well, I just wanted to introduce Phil, Phil Pfizer. He's a Lynn County Master Gardener, and he's going to talk about um, starting seeds and share us his um, expertise and his tips. So take it away, Phil. Okay, thank you. Um, this first slide, you notice the flat with the letter E and then the number. Keep that in mind, because we'll talk about this a little bit farther into the slide. And welcome everyone. I'm sure you're all just as anxious as I am to get in the garden, get things going. But if, I, if the weather forecast sound actually plays out, it sounds like we're about past the cold weather now and we should get into some warm, warmer days. So normally um, I give this presentation in January and February. So some of this is going to look like um, we should have already done it, which we probably should have. Um, one of the things is ordering seeds. I don't know if you've ordered your seeds or not, or if you order seeds, but what I found this year, unlike years in the past, is when I placed my order the second week of January, there were already a lot of seeds that were sold out. And I think we're seeing a real increase in the number of people who are gardening. So um, seed companies, I think, haven't been able to catch up to that yet. Another thing you want to do um, is purchase a high quality seed starting mix. And I emphasize if you're starting your own seeds, it's a good idea to have a starter mix as opposed to just a soilless potting soil. And the reason for that is the starting mix is a lighter mix. The roots can penetrate it very easily and you don't have a lot of um, sticks or bark or that kind of thing in there to interfere with the little seed. Um, and also depending on what container you're putting it in, um, a lot of times you just have to pick all that out. Otherwise it doesn't fit neatly inside your uh, starting container. You wanna develop a schedule for seed starting times um, I do that on a calendar, which is also what I use for my journal. Um, but you could do it with sticky notes, but the main emphasis there is early on, sit down with the seed catalog or with your seed packets and take a look at how much before you set the plants out, you need to be starting the plants. It's so easy to get enthusiastic too early and then you have leggy plants, um, or maybe even you have to start over again. The journal, I think, is an excellent idea. As I said, mine is nothing more than a calendar, and I write down when I do pretty much everything. So when I start seeds, when I transplant them, when I set them out in the garden, um, and then from year to year, I'm able to go back and review that, and I make a little note that says, okay, I started this a little bit earlier than I should have. Um, and then I know the next year to kind of change my timing a little bit. I also record the weather. And by doing that, I can look from year to year on how this year compares to last year, which kind of helps me adjust my schedules a little bit too. If you're growing plants inside and you're using fluorescent lights, they actually recommend replacing the tubes every year if you're running your lights for 12 to 14 hours a day. While the light might look bright, it actually loses a lot of its intensity. If you're using fluorescence, um, you can invest in grow lights, but you can also just use one warm tube and one cool tube, and you'll get basically that same light spectrum. I've been working for the last several years to replace all of my fluorescents with LEDs. And my guide for doing that is when my fluorescent light tubes go bad, or especially if the ballasts go bad, uh, that's the time to get rid of that and move to the LED. And LEDs have come down now so significantly in price that you can almost buy an LED for the cost of a couple of uh, tubes, of fluorescent tubes. I like the light of the LED, um, and we'll talk about that some more in a little bit. And then lastly, I like to try something new and different 
for me every year, whether it's a plant or a, a vegetable or a flower or um, a, a process. Um, like one year I, I tied all my tomatoes up using strings. Excuse me just a second, hey, get down. Um, you know, little things like that. The, um, the plant, the vegetable on the left is a daikon radish. And I don't know if you all have tried daikon radishes or not. I was introduced to them when I was traveling to Japan. And we use them in a lot of the stir fries. We just eat them um, raw. It's a very mild radish. And then the, the uh, round um, vegetable is a um, Cossack kohlrabi. This kohlrabi can grow up to six inches in diameter and not be woody and still maintains its flavor. It also keeps extremely well. Um, I'll harvest that in the fall and we'll be eating um, kohlrabi as a, in a dip or whatever uh, well past the holidays. Um, the key to this one is you want to harvest it before it starts to elongate. This is um, a list of life expectancy for vegetables, seeds. If you're like me, you'll have seeds that carry over from year to year. The question is, are they still viable? Well, the first key to having viable seeds is how they've been stored. Um, it should be stored in a cool, dry place. So if you have something like a, a quart jar with a lid or a jar of any size with a lid or even a Ziploc um, bag, that works very well and then just put it in the refrigerator. Um, and then another way of testing it, of course, if you really have questions about it, would be to um, do a, a germination trial just take a wet paper towel, put um, five or 10 seeds in the towel, put it inside a baggie. And after several days, just start checking it and you should get some germination and find out um, what percent of the seeds uh, will germinate. They also have this list. I couldn't find this available from a university. They did find it from a seed exchange and do you have the um, website or their address uh, there? This is just a small snapshot of everything that they have, but it gives you an idea on your flower seeds, how long um, that seed will last. And again, same kind of storage requirements. What Iowa State did publish was this little um, germination guide. Talks about the temperature, whether or not it takes light. Some plants require darkness to germinate. Um, it also talks about how many days it will take to germinate and number of weeks before you can plant it out outside, assuming that um, we're past the last frost date. And there is the link for that down at the bottom. And that list is a lot um, more extensive than just what I clipped out to show you here. As far as starting times, again, uh, I couldn't stress enough the urge that suppress the urge to start early. It just became, becomes a real problem when you have tomatoes that are 12 inches tall and flopping over, putting those out is a problem. And we'll talk about that towards the end of the presentation. But it's the same thing with flowers. They can get too leggy and then they just plain won't perform well. And you don't want to be holding the um, plants back um, because that can be a problem for the, um, as they mature. Um, when to plant them, simply a matter of counting back from um, when you plan on planting them out, the number of weeks and you can get that information off your seed packets. So in my example, if you, um, tomato takes five to seven weeks before you plant it out, and we generally say Mother's Day is the soonest you want to put things like um, your very tender tomatoes and beans and all that kind of thing out. Even though the last frost date is on average is the 29th of April, it's that um, surprise frost that comes that is a problem. 
Um, and then again, use a calendar or sticky notes to plan that schedule and then kind of stick pretty close to it. Seed packets just contain all kinds of information, anywhere from what the right soil temperature is for germination, how many weeks before you can transplant it out, uh, whether or not it needs light. It just, they're, they're a wealth of information. So I encourage you to study your seed packets and then sit down with your calendar or your sticky notes and put down um, your start dates, your transplant dates, that kind of information. The key takeaway there, don't rush it. Seed and plant selection, there are a lot of varieties now that are coming on the market that have been bred to be more disease resistant. And I know we like heirlooms, heirlooms we really like the flavor and everything, but if you have to use some sort of uh, fungicide in order to get a, a crop, then environmentally, that's not a, a good thing. So you kind of have to balance what you're trying to go for. Put some plants in that offer disease resistance along with the old standby favorites. And that way you kind of minimize how much um, uh, uh, activity you have to have in spraying and maintaining your garden. Use quality fresh seeds. Again, um, when you're done sowing this spring, put them in the refrigerator, keep them dry. Um, and then buy seeds from reputable sources. You can actually bring diseases in on the seeds if the seeds have not been um, carefully maintained and uh, accurately bred. So their source is very important. They're also able to buy from some companies now the, in the same variety, either the organic seed or non-organic seed. So you're getting more options that way. And then I think one of the greatest inventions ever is the uh, seed coating, making the seeds pelletized. So I used to plant my petunias in strip trays because I had those little tiny seeds that you just can't pick up individually. So I'd have to just sprinkle them on the ground and then tease them apart in order to transplant them. Now I get my petunias in pelletized seed. So I'm able to pick each seed up and put it in a cell. I think that's one of the greatest things they've come up with. And if you're into organic, uh, you can get the seed coating as, um, organic coatings as well. So you can be totally compliant with organic programs. As far as seeds, the pots and starter trays and things that you use to start uh, your seeds, you wanna make sure the containers are clean. Dirty pots um, just can harbor diseases. And also the um, pots that have um, the accumulation of um, mineral deposits around them. We don't use clay very much anymore, but we do use plastic. Um, and that will also accumulate uh, mineral deposits. And the reason you wanna make sure you get that scrubbed off is if the roots come in contact with the mineral, um, it dries the roots out. And so it can actually have a negative effect on your plants. If you need to clean your pots, if you're, if you're using new, you don't need to worry about this. But if you're using pots that you've used before, you wanna make sure you get the debris and everything out, wash them real well, then soak them in a bleach solution <clears throat> for at least 10 minutes, rinse them off and then let them dry. What I actually do <clears throat> is I, um, put the pots, I've got a wheelbarrow that's waterproof and I put the pots in it and soak them overnight. And that way I'd get rid of that step of brushing out the loose debris because that will all soak off the pot. And then I just um, move them right into a bleach solution and then rinse them off. So that they're sitting there overnight soaking but it cuts down quite a bit of work um, trying to scrub all that dirt out. You have to forgive my helpers here. Um, 
Here's some examples. These are commercially available at garden centers, uh, some box, big box stores, mail order catalogs. The one on the left is called a 50 plug tray. Uh, if you buy landscape plugs like Pakistandra or something like that, they typically will come in that kind of a tray. Um, uh, this is what I use to start my sweet corn. I'm kind of a sweet corn snob in that I have one variety that we really, really, really like, but I want to get it harvested early for my, because it's the one we freeze. Um, and in order to do that, I need to actually start with transplants. So I'll plant a number of these trays with seeds about two to three weeks ahead of when I think I'm going to be able to plant everything out. And then when I plant them out in the garden, I go along and I plant my next crop as seeds. So I've automatically done all my corn planting at one time and I've got it spaced about two to three weeks apart. So it's just the labor saver for me. The ones on the right is called a 288 flat. And there's each of those little squares is a half inch square. That's where I put all my tomato, peppers, now petunias, uh, zinnias, marigolds, every kind of flower that I and vegetable that I want to start early go into those little squares. The nice thing about that is I use a chopstick and I push it up through the hole in the bottom and you push out a nice little plug and it goes straight into your uh, next size container and you don't disturb the roots and it's very, very quick. The strip tray in the middle um, is what I use if I have still something that has very, very fine seeds. So you just kind of very gently sprinkle them in there into that. And then um, when you go to transplant it, again, I use a chopstick, but we you can use uh, plastic forks or whatever to bring the root ball out of there and then carefully tease it apart uh, and go ahead and plant. Some example, other examples of starting containers, starting from the left, there's the uh, peat pot strips, peat pot pots, there's croy pots. You can use plastic cups. Um, Want to make sure you have drainage, so put holes in it. The Jiffy 7s, um, Start out as a little pellet, add water, and it expands, makes a good growing media. Things like the peat pots and the jiffies are really good for plants that don't like to be transplanted. So if you are doing, like trying to get an early start on any of the uh, cucumbers or squash or anything like that, those are good pots to use because you can just set the whole pot and everything out. In the middle, um, is a kit called the pot maker. And what it is, is a round cylinder that you wrap a piece of newspaper around, fold it up in the bottom, rub it against that shape there, and it makes a nice little pot. Um, you can also use a soup can or any can in and around that size. It works just as well. I typically put a piece of masking tape across the bottom and maybe the side just to make sure that um, it doesn't fall apart. Um, you can also use things like this is a paper towel holder to roll. If you do something like that, put a little plug of newspaper in the bottom of it and that'll keep your soil from drifting through. The white container is a meat container. I think it had something like ground turkey or something in it. What I do with that is I punch a bunch of holes in it. And then I use another one underneath it. And that way I've got a nice little tray. And so I don't have, when I water it, I don't have water running through onto my counter. This was a mushroom uh, container, same idea, works fine. Labels, you can buy labels. Um, these are made from old Venetian blinds. And um, I just cut them to the size I want. Uh, it's a good use for those plastic blinds. These also are, these are popsicle sticks and you can use them for labels, um, tongue depressors. Um, somebody was telling me one of the 
dollar stores or something like that sells a lot of those for a really cheap price. I'm not quite as fond of wood because wood soaks up the water and it uh, can be a little bit harder to read. When, if you use the plastic labels, I find that a pencil actually holds up longer than the permanent markers. The permanent markers will fade in the sun, but pencil I have not found uh, fades. Another um, marking utensil is um, they look like a marker, but they're actually a liquid um, paint material. They use them for marking uh, cattle ear tags, and those are extremely um, permanent. They don't fade at all. And then as far as getting plants planted, um, I made this little dibble. Um, a lot of you guys up at the uh, greenhouse up at Lau Park that the Master Gardeners run, uh, just use a finger. I started using the dibble back many, many, many years ago. And for me, it just works well because I can make a nice big hole. And then there's my chopstick for separating the plants or pushing them out of the plug. Here's a couple different seeds and ways to plant them. Um, the seed at the top is a pelletized petunia. The one at the bottom is out of the coal family. And, and I don't remember um, which one. It's probably a cabbage or a cauliflower or something like that. But I use the tweezers in order to pick those up. You have to have kind of a light touch. Uh, if you squeeze too hard on the petunias, the pelletized seed, it will crush. So uh, you really have to be careful with that. The um, harder seeds, um, you don't have to worry about crushing them, but you do have to worry about them going squirting out of your tweezers and ending up where you don't want them. So um, just handle that kind of with care. Some people, my fingers aren't dexterous enough to do that easily. And that's why I've gone to the tweezers. Another way of doing it is um, using a pencil, dipping it in water and then touching the seed and the seed should stick to the pencil and you can carry it over to um, where you're going to plant it. And another option that seems to work fairly well is take a piece of paper, make a V shape, put your seed in there and then just take a, a pencil or something like that and carefully slide the seeds down the paper and into the pot. As far as getting your seeds germinated, um, heat mats work very well. Uh, you can get them with a built-in thermostat or you can get them with um, a control that you can set the temperature. Most seeds like 70 to 75 uh, degrees. So if you're in a cool area, then a heat map may be something you wanna consider. Back when I had all fluorescent lights, I didn't have to worry about the um, temperature because fluorescence gave off enough heat that my area was plenty warm for germinating. But going to the LEDs now, um, I've had to add a couple of little heat maps and you only have to have the plant on there long enough for it to germinate. And once it germinates, then um, you can move another flat on there or uh, whatever. Some other options are putting your seeds on top of the refrigerator where it's warmer than it is uh, other places in the house. Um, in the old days when you used to have pilot lights on your ovens, uh, that was an excellent way to uh, maintain it as well. Um, as far as light goes, we talked about the fluorescent bulbs. Uh, if you go with LEDs, you want to get as bright a light as you can. 5,000 lumens is great. And the color, somewhere between four and 5,000. Um, and that will give you a really nice amount of light. They do make lights that are um, intended for plants. They offer just the spectrum that the light that the plant needs. Um, but unless you're going for blooms or uh, growing out for um, fruit, you really can get away with just using the standard uh, LEDs or fluorescents. K 
key is to keep the lights four to six inches above the plants. In my case, um, I have shelves, wire racks that I have my flats sitting on, and I have my lights up far enough that as the plants grow up, they have room to grow before they hit the light. But when I'm starting them, that's a problem because there's too much space between where the flat is and the light. And so what I do is take a bunch of old flats and just turn them upside down, slide the um, flat in um, on top of that. And then as the plant grows up, I remove the old flats until um, I'm ready to move them out. As far as the potting mix goes, you can buy a lot of commercial mixes. Um, these are uh, the ones, the one on top, the Iowa State mix is the one I use at home. And I use that both um, for starting seeds, the bigger seeds, and also for all my pots and my hanging baskets and everything. The small seeds on um, delicate plants like the petunias, the lissom, um, that kind of thing, I actually do use a seed starting mix for that. The bottom um, mix, the Cornell mix is what we use up at the greenhouse. And uh, that one works extremely well for both starting seeds and for transplanting into larger uh, containers. You do end up though with sticks. So as you're filling your containers, you'll have to pull the sticks out, which is not a horrible task. So when we're talking about germination, the soil temperature is more important than the air temperature to start with. But as soon as things germinate, then the air temperature comes into play in a big way as well. And then both of them are important. Um, there is a minimum and a maximum or an optimal range. Lettuce, for example, will germinate at 32 degrees, it might take it up to 49 days, and you'll get about a 98% germination in that time. Whereas at a temperature of 77 degrees, it will germinate in just a couple days, and you get a 99%. So you get 1% more in the germination, but you get them a lot faster if the soil is warm. A years ago, I was doing a presentation um, down at the WMT Outdoor Living Show, and I had a woman come up afterwards and she was asking about beets. She said, it takes me generally three tries to really get a crop of beets. And as we talked, I found out that her first crop she tried to grow was right away in the spring as soon as she could get in the soil and had a very poor germination. Then she waited a little bit and tried it again, had a better germination. And finally, um, well into May, she planted them again and had a really good crop. And I think the reason was because while beets will germinate at, coil, at cold temperatures, uh, they don't germinate anywhere nearly as well. As far as uh, seeding, the um, recommendation is always to start with a moist mix. Now, what we've learned over time is when we're talking moist, originally they used to say, uh, you need to add water to the point where you can make a ball out of it and uh, it should stick totally together. But I found that it's, it should be moist um, just to the point where you can almost make a ball out of it. And I think it's easier to work with. We've also discovered that you can over moist the soil and um, the seeds can actually be too wet to germinate well. So you wanna um, kind of try and find a balance there. Follow the package directions as far as seeding. It'll tell you how deep to plant them. Uh, as well as whether or not it needs heat, light, so forth. Label rows and containers. Um, I actually take those plastic labels and I cut them down to a smaller label so that I, they fit in the different containers. 
And so some containers get a four inch long label, other containers might get a two inch long label that's only uh, three eighths of an inch wide or a quarter inch wide because that's what fits in those cells. But the main thing is you wanna label it, you wanna label it in such a way that you can keep track of what you are growing because it's very frustrating to get to the point where you're ready to put things out and you don't know what the color was of the flower or um, which tomatoes you're putting where. If you notice that bottom flap with the numbers, that's one of the ways we do it up at the greenhouse. So the flap is labeled uh, a letter of the alphabet. In this case, this one's E. And then each of the rows are numbered. And if it happens to be a tray that's got the division, then you plant one variety in the first set of rows and the second variety in the back row, then that would get labeled, uh, if it's the first, for example, it would be E1A and E1B. And we write that information on the packet. Um, we also, when we, I took this picture, this was the only way we were identifying things, but it was always such a pain to have to go find the packet to figure out what was planted in there. That now we make a little label. This is where we use about a two inch long label and we write on the label as well. And that just makes it easier to tell what's um, being planted there. Um, the picture at the top is um, one, well, it's almost two of the shelves at um, my place. Um, and you can see kind of the spacing between the light and the plant. Um, that works pretty well. Once you've seeded it, um, bottom water it and give it a very, very light, gentle misting. If you water from the top, it's really easy to float the seeds out. And so you might float them into the adjoining uh, cells or you might just float them right into the water. So bottom watering, and when we do that, it probably takes less than five minutes to soak up a tray. You don't want to use totally dry potting mix because it takes that forever. So by mixing it together to make it moist, that'll speed that watering um, process up a lot. And then just give it a light, mix, a light spray. Um, and that's the same thing then as you're watching it when it's germinating. It, if you see it starting to dry down a little bit, just take your mister or your little squirt bottle and give it a light uh, watering that way. Want to put a cover on it, you can either use the domes or you can use uh, saran wrap or something like that. But as soon as you see the seeds germinate, you see the little plants coming up, it's a good idea to take that off and let it have some air circulation. And another thing that I do is um, I have a fan that blows very gently. So the fan is, is placed quite a ways away, but it blows very gently across that um, wall with the uh, plants on it. I think that helps with the uh, drying down. It also helps reduce any chance of damp off. Um, and it helps strengthen the plant a little bit too by um, moving the stems ever so gently as they would move if they were growing outside. Helps strengthen them. Um, as far as the soilless mixes go, there's all kinds of them available. You wanna look for one with the seed starting that is designed for seeds because that way you get away from the, the sticks and everything. And then I showed you the soilless mix formulas. Um, you can make your own using garden loam and, and peat moss and perlite. Back in the day when um, I was going to Iowa State, we, I worked in the greenhouse and we would mix up this um, potting mix. There'd be three of us, we had a grinder. So each one would take turns putting in a shovel of either the soil or the peat or the perlite and the grinder would kind of blend it all together. We heated the greenhouse back in those days with steam and there was a pipe that came up out of the floor that was about six inches long we had a um, 30 gallon garbage can with a hole in the bottom 
we'd fill that full of our mix. We'd put it over the pipe and we would steam the mix. And um, that worked really well back then. So when I, when Jeannie and I uh, started, uh, got married and started um, our own little gardens and everything, this is what I did and I would bake it in the oven for um, 30 minutes at a, to 180 degrees. And I just loved the smell of that baking soil. Jeannie, not so much. So when we, uh, when I went over to the, the potting mix, the soilless mix, uh, she was quite happy with that. The downside to the soil mix, first of all, is if you don't um, sterilize it properly, you can either over sterilize it or under sterilize it. And if you under sterilize it, you might have disease problems or even insect problems. If you over sterilize it, you're killing off a lot of the microorganisms. Um, and also it's heavy, so it's a lot harder to work with. When it comes to transplanting, Generally, we advise that you should wait for the second set of true leaves to appear. And then you wanna handle the, the, plant, the plants by the leaves only. You might think you have a very gentle touch, um, but it's so easy to crush the cells in those stems. So by handling by the leaves, you get away from any of that concern. Um, you wanna tease the roots apart very carefully and again, that's one of the downsides, I think, to planting in mass trays, but um, for some seeds, you can't really avoid it. So just be careful how you separate the uh, plant and the roots. Um, you can plant most everything slightly deeper when you transplant it, but most plants won't really benefit from that. But the one that does is the tomatoes. They, all those little hairs you see on the stem, those will become roots. So for example, when we transplanted, well, when I transplanted the other day, I took them out of my plugs and the, the plant, the tomatoes were about oh, two inches tall, maybe not even that. And I put them in a deep three inch square pot so that the only thing that was showing was just a little bit of stem and those top leaves. And now um, they've already grown beyond that. So um, that really helps them develop. You wanna gently firm the soil around the stem and the root. You don't wanna pack it too hard, but you want it to be firm so that there is um, plenty of contact there for when water comes, um, is soaked up that it does actually uh, come up into all the soil. Talked about labeling things. It's important with transplanting. And then I usually bottom water until um, the plants are sort of established. So maybe uh, after about a week, then I go to watering on top. Very gently, use a very gentle flow. But again, um, I believe some of that action on the stems just helps strengthen them. Back to same discussion about the lights. Um, this is the picture of my uh, setup back before I started replacing the fluorescents. It just amazes me how much brighter the LEDs are. Um, fertilizing, I, well, first of all, follow the instructions on the container, but the first time you fertilize, I usually use a half strength. I think the plants can use it because in my um, soilless mix, if I buy it commercially, there isn't any fertilizer in it. Um, but you wanna give them only a half shot because um, that's kind of strong for those tiny little roots until they start to get developed. And then when you're ready to set them out in the garden, uh, you wanna be sure and harden them off and we'll talk about that a little bit more. There are many garden options. And the one on the left is just a tomato plant. I got a tomato cage around it. Um, I do recommend somehow or another anchoring that down because once the tomato gets up, it doesn't take a lot of wind to knock things over. Um, beets actually grow quite nicely in a pot. And 
the lettuce you see, those are concrete mixing tubs. And um, before I got into hydroponics, that's how I grew my lettuce for um, in the house over winter. And I just used two concrete mixing tubs, put holes in the top one, put a, um, set it on top of the painter's cones, those little plastic cones, and uh, drilled a hole and screwed an empty water bottle in through the hole and cut the end out. And then I was able to check my water depth with a stick and then add water through that cone. And then capillary action just took care of watering uh, the lettuce for me. Um, the one down at the right is just a traditional standard garden. Um, happens to be mine from a few years ago. Other ideas, the picture on the upper left is the Marion Community Garden. And you can see back towards the back, uh, that's a uh, four by eight raised bed, 10 inches high. Um, those work extremely well. Then we wanted to show some other ideas. So this is a plastic stock tag, tank. This is a metal stock tank. We had to drill holes in the bottom, obviously, for drainage. I didn't get it in the picture, but there's also a retaining wall block, raised bed. We used to have a greenhouse up there that was donated by Marion Community School. Uh, and that went the way of the Drecho. <clears throat> These are veggie shrubs that are handicap accessible. Um, that's another option. Doesn't have to be for handicap though, because I gotta tell you, it's really nice having your plants up where you can just stand there and, and weed and everything with no problem. This is a gutter. Um, and I had um, onions and lettuce, uh, spinach and radish all planted together in that. Um, the downside was it took a lot of water. What, I, what started me thinking about that was I was working um, at a place in New York and the, one of the program managers came in talking about her goofy husband. Um, they had uh, a long narrow lot with a lot of shade, but the outside of their lot, and it was fenced, and the outside of their lot had more sun. So when her husband re-roofed, he took the gutters and hung it on the fence and then planted them. And she thought it was really a goofy idea. And I thought, I think that sounds like a good idea. And it proves to be. We talked about this and then you can see the tomatoes growing there in the uh, pot as well. There's a lot of tomato breeding that's being done now to make uh, more compact vegetables. So that's one of the things you probably wanna check for when you're ordering your seeds, if you're gonna grow in uh, containers, you can actually grow full-size tomato fruit in a uh, much smaller size plant. Then there's hydroponics. And this is just some examples, the arrow garden. Um, you can grow herbs or vegetables. And I've never tried it, but they say you can actually grow things like tomatoes in that. The one in the middle is one that I built using two four foot long uh, LED lights. And those, um, that's just on a furniture dolly with um, a couple pipes holding up the support for the lights. This is a tub that's got the lids that fold in on themselves. Uh, and this is um, a black waiters um, tub for, um, that they use a busboy's tub is what I'm trying to say. This is another variation of that. Uh, this was an LED light that I thought was a really good idea. And I had it set up so that as the plants grow, I could raise the support, uh, but the light didn't last very long. So uh, lesson learned there. I'm not sure what the lesson is, but some of my LEDs fail way early. So they're not quite as robust as they originally advertised them. This next couple of slides, <clears throat> excuse me, um, are just for your reference. And it, and it lists the tolerance to cold that various vegetables have. And so I'm not gonna go into this, but you'll have this to refer to if you like. Average last frost date, according to Iowa State, um, is April 29th. I don't think they've updated this yet. I checked 
uh, I didn't actually check this year, I checked last year and it was still, this was the latest that they had. But that's an average. And so some years uh, we may not be that late and other years, um, wasn't it last year or the year before we had one getting close to Mother's Day. So now you wanna get the garden ready for the seeds and transplants. I always recommend starting with a soil sample. If you haven't taken one for a couple of years, it's a good idea. Iowa State's no longer doing that on campus, but they um, have partnered with this AgriSource Laboratories. So you can pick up the information at the extension office and then take your sample and just send it up uh, to these guys. They will come back with a recommendation when you fill out the form, you'll tell them what it is you're sampling for. I'm growing a flower bed, I'm growing vegetables, it's lawn. And they will tailor the uh, recommendation based on what it is you're planning on growing. Why is that important? You can see by um, this chart where most plants, the nutrients are available within a certain range of uh, your pH levels. And so that's just, good information to have and it kind of explains um, why it's important to know what it what your um, levels are. When you get ready to plant things out and this assumes you're going to a, a regular uh, vegetable garden in a traditional kind of planting but it also applies to raised beds. You want to rotate your vegetable crops to non-family sites so what that means is if you've been growing tomatoes in one area, when you go to rotate, you wanna rotate completely out of the family. So don't put potatoes or peppers or eggplant in that same area because that's all part of the same family. You'd wanna to go to something like beans or vine crops or something like that. Wanna make sure you start with a clean area. If you can till it deeply, that helps those roots develop, especially for growing root crops. You want to incorporate your nutrients. Always a good idea to add organic matter. Um, we're lucky around here. We've got two sources of compost. If you live in Marion, you've got the Marion uh, yard waste place where you can get compost. Um, if you're in Lynn County, you can get um, compost from down at Mount Trashmore. And both places for the homeowner are free. And then watering is very important. Most vegetables need at least a week, oh, and flowers need at least an inch of water a week. What that means is an inch total. So if you have um, a rain of a half an inch, then all you would need to add would be a half an inch more to make up the inch. Hardening off is extremely important if you've been growing inside. So if you don't, uh, the plant will basically probably burn. Um, it's a process that takes about a week and you want to start in a very shady protected area and then gradually uh, expose it to more sunlight. It's a good idea to let the plants dry slightly. And when I say slightly, if you can catch them just before wilt, that's about right. If you have wind and cold or storm, be sure and move them in or get them well protected. And that's why a lot of times I carry plants out in the morning. I go through a nice sunny day, but I put them back in at night because maybe we're gonna have winds or cold weather. And then when you're transplanting, avoid um, root damage as much as you can. If you've planted in paper pots or peat pots or something like that, you wanna make sure that you remove any of the material from the pot that might stick above the soil. And the reason for that is because it works like a wick and it builds, uh, it dries your material, your container out and the little roots can't get through that then to get out into the garden. Typically when I plant using those, I'll peel that whole top back, but I'll also take my thumb and tear the bottom a little bit just to make absolutely sure the plant's gonna be able to find its way out. It's a good idea to give your plant some protection um, and planting late in the day in the afternoon um, means that it doesn't have to sit under the scorching sun all day. So it just gives it the night 
the late afternoon and the night to kind of help adjust to being moved to the outside. You can use a starter fertilizer. You can make your own, You've got a formula there. And there's also commercial starter mixes available. And that just gives the plant a chance to get off to a little bit more um, active start. If in fact you did get started too early or spring didn't come when it's supposed to and things are getting kind of leggy, it's with tomatoes, uh, you can plant them in a trench or you can plant them deep and you'll actually come out with a good, good looking plant. First advantage to doing that is you don't have that long, if you notice the one on the left, that long stem up there wiggling in the wind and being a good candidate for breaking off or just um, wind burning. Um, the center picture was intended to show, um, first of all, the root development. And you can see I've got roots growing all along the stem in both uh, pictures. The one on the left, I planted deep, but I waited too late in the season. So the ground had warmed up that deep. Um, what I was trying to show is root development towards the top and not so much at the bottom because the ground was colder. Uh, but what I uh, think you can get an idea of, is there's a lot of root that will develop and strengthen your plant. I use row covers everywhere. You can buy these at garden centers, mail order catalogs. Um, I use this to stabilize the weather. If you look at the center picture, this one is an insect uh, fabric control. This one is a frost blanket. And these will provide protection down um, sort of pretty cold temperatures. Um, I also use it as an insect barrier. I put it over my uh, vine crops especially, and I don't take it off uh, until I've got at least the second true set of flowers. And the reason for that is by then, I'll be typically past the um, squash vine borer moth. And so I don't need to do any kind of um, insect treatment um, because I've kept her out of it. An another way to get by her is just to wait to set the um, plant the seeds. But this way I'm getting an earlier crop and it's, it's not um, really a problem um, for that. The um, disadvantage to the row covers is, well, on the plus side, it creates an excellent environment. Here you can see where I set the plants out. That's what they look like. On the downside is it is a good environment for weed uh, growth. So you do have to get crawl underneath there uh, periodically and get your weeds out. I always get asked, how do I get early tomatoes? And the first thing is um, use early varieties that will um, develop faster. You can warm the soil using clear plastic. Downside to clear plastic though is you get a lot of weed germination. So the recommendation there is just before you're ready to plant your plants, take the clear plastic off, um, do a, a cultivation to get any weeds stirred up or, or killed off, then plant your plants. And then um, you can either go to um, another plastic or my favorite is I take two layers of newspaper, don't wanna go beyond two and put that down and then put uh, grass clippings on top of that. And I get a very good weed barrier that way. Um, to keep the paper from blowing around while I'm trying to work with it, I take one of those black tubs that you saw on an earlier slide, put water in it, and then I just drag the newspaper through there. All you have to do is just pull it through once and that gets it wet enough that it'll actually stay put. They also make plastics now that have um, infrared transmitting films built into them. So you get the advantages of warming the soil, uh, but the weeds don't germinate because the UV doesn't go through them. So that's another option. And then if you get into some of the colored ones like the uh, red, 
that's supposed to help the tomato plants set fruit. Um, so that's another side benefit of trying to keep your warm your soil up. And if you get out there and you're trying to get the early uh, tomato, these wall of waters are actually quite effective. You fill the tubes up with water. And then if it's going to get cold at night, you just kind of close that top uh, and it will keep your tomato plant um, protected for some very cold nights. I used to do this a lot, but then I kind of have steered away from it. I'm not trying to win contests anymore. Um, and then um, the other thing is to mulch and also uh, most tomatoes, if you're planting indeterminates, will grow and grow and grow. So you wanna be sure you stake them. Um, I also um, cage my determined tomatoes just because I like to keep the fruit off the ground. Uh, that way I don't get uh, so much fruit rot. Here are some resources that I thought might be interesting <clears throat> um, if you're interested in going to look at these. Um, it's just good. Um, fun reading. And then if you have questions, uh, there's our email links and uh, our Facebook page. We encourage you to take advantage of those. If you have questions, call into the Hort line. Um, there's somebody there that uh, either can answer the question right away or they'll go research the answer and get back to you. So any questions? Phil, so I've heard about putting Epsom salt on like um, tomatoes when you're planting or potatoes. Have you ever tried any of that? And is that recommended? Um, Iowa State, I have not seen where Iowa State recommends it. I know the old extension um, website. people like was it Jerry big, Baker Mr. Gardner. that had all the organic um, remedies for everything um, talked about that. But um, I've not seen any university uh, recommendation. I'm not saying that's out there. I just have not there. I just haven't seen it. You know, then back in the day, they used to say put two uh, matchsticks under the plant and under your pepper plants, and that would give you a much uh, better pepper plant. But again, <laughs> I haven't seen any research validating that. Thank you. Yes. This has been since since we got our seed packet, and I assume it's getting a little late to be germinating stuff in the house. What is that? Can we? Oh, um, Are they, yeah. The marigolds. Nasturtiums. 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 Okay. Is it okay to germinate them in the pot that we're gonna have them outside? Absolutely. Um, I think they recommend soaking those for a couple of days too. Oh, you, okay. Um, mm. we've, we've tried it two ways. We've tried scratching the seed coat and we've also tried soaking them. And I think the consensus is uh, soaking them is much more effective. Okay. And, and then they just were planting nasturtiums up at the greenhouse side maybe a week or so ago. So, you know, if you want to start them now and start your soaking and everything, uh, then you can put them in, or if you're growing them in pots, you can get them uh, potted up when things uh, settle down a little bit and you should be good. And as far as, since I'm gonna just put the seeds in the pot, should I have some of the, the seed starter mix as well as the regular potting soil for them? Nasturtiums are a big rooted um, seed. So you can use your uh, intended potting mix for the pot. You can plant into that and they'll be just fine. Oh, okay. Oh, good. This has been really helpful. I'm excited to plant my seeds. Well, good. <laughs> yeah. Not Very really interesting. Things come up. Mm -hmm. But I think your package should tell you how long to soak them. This one doesn't say. No, it doesn't say anything about soaking. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, 
I would soak them for probably three to five days. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. In just regular tap water? Yes. Okay. Yep, that'll work. What we got up at the greenhouse is a bunch of little jelly jars. And so we just write uh, what the, which nasturtium it is on a tag and drop that in the jelly jar with the water and the seeds. Oh, okay. Oh, great. You'll be able to tell when they're pretty well soaked up because they'll swell up quite a bit. That'll be fun to watch. Mm -hmm. All right, is there any more questions for Phil? Well, it's I very informative, you. thank you. Thank you. Enjoy, spring will be here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, I would put in a plug if you don't mind. Um, we have our plant sale, the Master Gardener plant sale coming up on the 8th of May. It's at the American Legion in Marion which is right off of um, 7th Avenue. And it'll be from eight in the morning until noon. And we are um, going to do a face-to-face uh, -face sale this year. But I think our plan is to spread everything way out so that um, we can keep the social distancing going. But okay. we are excited about being able to actually have the plant sale um, there at the Legion again. That really works out well. Very good. American Legion. Thank you. We need to read. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Phil, and for sharing your tips and all your knowledge. And we look forward to planting our seeds and watching them grow. Yes. Yep. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very thank much. Bye-bye. This was awesome. Thanks. And thank you, Kathy.